So we know we are here today because it's uh, at the same time uh, in Brussels, the EU Select Summit is, help, is happening, it's taking place here, bringing leaders from the EU, but also from the community of Latin American Caribbean states all together. And uh, as we, we, we know that the aim of that summit is to strengthen the EU uh, Select Partnership, working together to achieve fair, green, and digital transition, and demonst demonstrated a shared commitment to upholding the rules-based international order. So this is the background for our meeting, uh, which you know, I see as um, a fringe EU, uh, EU Select Summit. But the question for me is why is that necessary? Why we are here uh, in this parallel conversation? And, and I will be trying to unpack three or four reasons why we should be here and why we have to then challenge our leaders regarding how we can uh, promote changes. So we are in a historical moment where, yes, we, are, we have the coming of the climate change, we have high interest debts payment in low and middle income countries. In some of these countries, the, the uh, interest debt payment is three, four times more than what they need to promote green transition. We just left the pandemic and we saw what happens with the vaccine appetite. You have in developing countries the collapse of the manufacturing workforce. We're still dealing with the legacies of the 2007 and 8 financial crisis. We have calls for decolonization, which is not really clear what that means. And of course, despite, um, apart from the many other wars around the globe, especially in the global south, we also have the Russian and Ukrainian war, which is impacting prices uh, around the globe. So, to me, what these events uh, uh, highlight is that our current international institutions and our international monetary financial system and, uh, and our, uh, our economic, economics, uh, economic theory, as uh, Arif had mentioned, they are not being built or they are not, um, they are not being able to deal with these issues in the way we should. So, of course, we need collaboration. Collaboration is key. But my question is in what terms? When you think, for example, about the green transition or the digital transition, when you, we go back and think, okay, what is the fair and social and just transformation when no one is left behind? So to me, this, the, the transitions or the, the fairness just can happen if we, uh, if this global and north-south um, dialogue is challenging the legacies of colonialism in our institutions and the thinking that we have about capitalism. For example, let's think about data, you know, the digital transition. We know that the capture and processing of data unfolds a process that has been told as the data, the data relations, right? So we get this natural uh, conversion of daily life info and then you turn into this data stream. And uh, as has been argued by many scholars, this result in nothing less than a new social order based on continuous tracking of data and offering unprecedented news, uh, sorry, unprecedented opportunities for social discriminations and behavioral influence. So how does this process play out in an order, in an international order that is embedded in power unbalances? How is the South-North dialogue taking into consideration that the data relations enact a new form of data colonialism, normalizing the exploitation of human beings through data, but in a context where the big tech companies, in the same way that the traditional big corporation, corporations in the 60s and 50s went to the global south due to a weak labor, labor laws, now they are going back to the global south as big tech companies using weak um, data protection law in the global south to extract their pro uh, profit. Many times impacting democratic process in these countries as we have seen very clear in Brazil and India. So how is this dialogue dealing, for example, with these issues? How is dealing with the global identity, global digital identity initiatives, for example, that we see in Kenya and Uganda that has been initiated by international organizations and private companies in a format that they acknowledge you never been possible in countries such as the UK because it means excessive control and access to individuals' uh, personal information and freedom 
and then give it to private companies. That would never been accepted in these countries. So there is no South and North dialogue if these aspects are not the central in our discussions. The idea, of digital, the idea that digital transformation will increase prosperity of our citizens is a fallacy if it doesn't challenge both the colonial legacies and the profit motive that drives the private sector. This kind of approach enables all the dependencies while fomenting new ones. And the same can be said about the green transition. Think, think the need of raw material to enable this transition. Celso Furtado, one of the most important economists from Brazil, as many other Latin American economists in the 1950s, was committed with a national democratic process for Brazil and other peripheral countries, including industrialization, national autonomy, distribution of income and wealth, especially land, and regional, and regional uh, development. But by 1973, when he uh, wrote The Myth of Development, he was deeply concerned with the destructive tendencies of capitalism. And, it, and that is actually one aspect that differ his views from not only from the modern, modern, modernization theory, but also structuralism itself. Because these two approaches see a positive, um, the po they have a positive view of both development and capitalism. What Celso Furtado is telling us in the 1970s is that in economics, this myth of development is found in an idea which is taken as a given that development cartels observe in the West, in countries that uh, have led the Industrial Revolution, such as Britain, but also which later managed to be the national economic systems, such as Western Europe, the US, and Japan. So he's saying that what has happened in these countries can be universalized. He called this the myth of progress, the myth of economic development, which refers to the erroneous belief that the standard of consumption found in a minority who is part of these highly industrialized countries will one day be accessible to the great population's masses in so-called at the time third world or now developing countries. And since then we have economists working regarding complex schemes of process of uh, capital accumulation driven by technological advances with little or no attention to the social, environment, cultural, and, and the idea of uh, the cultural exponential growth of capital stock. And my question is, as Arif already started this talk, uh, is the economic theory challenging this? The neglected of environment in all the aspects of well-being and human development back at the Fusels Furtado's time and now is not a choice or a simply, a simply uh, oversight by economists who intellectual capabilities you know, is nowhere to be doubt, but it's the linear uh, taking on progress that is detached from social context and its, its specific particularities for each region of the globe. It's that kind of take that allowed for short and long-term tourization using complex models of national economy where both were excluded the growing dependency of, high, of highly industrialized countries on the natural resources of other countries, and the consequence for the later of the predatory use of their resources by the former. Take, for example, now the US in their industrial policy, right? That has at the center the issue of decarbonization, which when you read about it, basically means a consumption of electric SUV instead of a petrol SUV. What does that mean for countries such as Chile, Argentina, and Bolivia? Right. We, yes, we need to decarbonize our economy as quickly as possible in order to avoid the worst of climate change. But as the world moves towards renewables and away from fossil fuels as an energy source, we can't forget that technology and minerals behind this green transition needs to come from somewhere. And this somewhere is primarily countries in the global south. The supply chain which carries lithium, copper, cobalt, and other minerals essential to renew the renewable technology from the peripheries to the imperial cores, from places like Chile and Bolivia to places like the United States and Europe, are built upon, and that has to be clear, we can't deny that, are built upon a foundation of colonialism, imperialism, hyper-exploitation, and ecocide, and displacement of indigenous people. And all these components also question our current economic system, capitalism. 
So how can we really talk about the fair green transition without talking about capitalism, without going back to points already raised by Furtado in 1970s? And now, finally, I'm almost done. Uh, let's consider in this talk you know, this idea of fair and social and just and transformation, ensuring that no one is left behind in a context of our current uh, monetary financial order. There is no fairness under the dollar hegemony. There is no way for that to happen. Simply speaking, the dollar hegemony mean, means high costs for developing countries in terms of monetary policy because of exchange rate vulnerability. It means lack of autonomy regarding monetary and fiscal policy. It means balance of payment issues given a trade based in dollar. And it means uh, capital gains through a speculation against high yields in developing countries. And apologies for getting too technical, and I can unpack each of these points, but what I wanted to make sure is that to be against dollar hegemony is not a left anti-imperialist plot. It, it can be, I agree. <laughs> but it's, it's the acknowledgement that in the current, with the current international monetary and financial system, it's too costly for developing countries to think about the green, green transition, to think about development. And you need, again, have this point on the table. There is no economic theory and I repeat, there is no economic theory that can grasp what our international monetary financial system is. And I apologize to my international political economy friends. I'm not ignoring their work. But when you think about international institu institutions, from UNCADAD to IMF, there is no framework that deals with this hierarchy that put at the center the cost of the dollar hegemony for most of the countries. So there is myself, Fawa, who is here, and other colleagues, that come up with the, ter the term international financial subordination in attempt to provide a research agenda where this hierarchy of the international monetary financial system is at the center of the analysis. For us, the international financial subordination is about unearthing why the structural power of finance takes a particular violent form and expression in developing countries. And this needs to be on the table. This needs to be at the core of the South-North dialogue. And this approach also demands a much more critical take towards finance. But not finance per se, but finance within capitalism and the drive for profit. Leaders need to discu discuss and be aware that no green or digital transformation will happen in a fair way if we accept a solution based on money growing out of nowhere or getting money from the financial market as you're gonna have all this accessibility to this. And here I'm directly, I direct have in my mind the blending finance kind of instrument, it, particularly in the context of the dollar hegemony. So I will stop here because this is the international financial coordination is my research, it's very close to my heart and I can he stay here the entire afternoon. But I hope with this points, what I want to say is there is no fairness, there is no green and digital transition with no one left in behind if you don't acknowledge these legacies of colonialism, power imbalances, and most importantly, how this is intrinsically linked to capitalism. And, and I really um, or urge for our leaders, especially the Global South leaders, to go back uh, to Celso Furtado and his points regarding the development of capitalism, the opportunities for the Global South countries. Thank you.